Uh, right, so let's get going. Um, I'd like each of you to, to briefly introduce yourself and then answer this question, how Connected TV contributes to total TV audience reach. There's been a lot of discussion about that and I'm sure the audience would appreciate your opinions on that. So why don't we start first with JDev all the way down there on the end. Hi. Um, right, just a bit of a disclaimer. I've, I'm carrying a bit of a cough, so if I do cough or get a bit fidgety, I promise it's not because of the audience or I'm bored. <laughs> uh, I drew the short straw. <laughs> <laughs> I might cough when these guys start talking, because I might just get bored. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm JDev. I look after the demand at Pubmatic uh, across EMEA, across for CTV and OTT. And, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> How it contributes to total TV reach, right. CTV. Right, I've got two minutes to answer this. The, su the subject <laughs> of, our, of our conference okay. <laughs> in, in 30 seconds. Right, uh, I think there's lo loads of different ways, but um, to put it into perspective, let's not take our eye off the ball. CTV is TV in that the medium is TV and the audience are doing exactly the same thing they always have been, just watching the TV screen. Um, it's just that the buying, well, the f internet has enabled them to do so much more with the TV now. It's kind of like a mobile phone on steroids, right? So you've got apps and all these other channels that you can access. Um, so it's just a case of advertisers now having to adjust and adapt their planning and buying methods to reach these audiences. But it's, it's pretty much TV still, and the audiences are still there. Okay. Katie? Yeah, so I'm Katie Copeman. I head up um, ad sales at Warner Brothers Discovery, Legacy Discovery. Um, so Connected TV is now pretty much sort of fundamental to the delivery of most forms of video content on large screen in, in the home. And But the problem with, with it, obviously, is a, is a lot to do with measurement at the moment. So we know that it does contribute to the total reach of television. We just don't quite know how much. And that's, that's the fundamental question that we all want answered, right? Is, especially from an advertiser perspective, you're no longer able to quite deliver the reach and frequency that you did with your, you know, um, campaigns that are planned against demo, you know, and, uh, but, and you know that they're viewing on the screen somewhere else, but you just can't add that, that reach in another way yet, but, and that's where we need to get to. Yeah. It's a bit more complex than that, but yeah. It's exciting times for you because you are just about to unify two completely different data sets. <laughs> which hopefully will give you, um, well, I assume you're going to unify them, <laughs> if I believe what your CEO yeah. is saying. Um, that should give you a pretty interesting view. One, one data set, I suppose HBO Max, is probably um, a more premium approach, uh, uh, whereas Discovery is more of a straight TV approach. Um, I wonder if that's going to give you any additional in insights. I think it's really interesting, actually, because so Discovery Plus, we launched an ad light, ad supported tier in the UK um, in the middle of March. And what we sort of talk about as Discovery is that we're real world content that often is focused around people's genuine real life passions. And so actually, when it comes to contextual or behavioural um, advertisers, that's a really powerful environment to be in. So we, we feel like actually for certain advertisers, we're probably in the most premium environment you could be in. Um, and also, often with our content, it's something that someone's actually really leaned into and selected that in a way that, you know, kind of everyone watches Game of Thrones and everyone watches some of those big shows, but people who are watching some of our content, it's a, it's a very active kind of lean-in choice. So, you know, I think that, it, yes, there will be two different data sets coming together. Who knows how quickly or in what way? And that's going to... I'm looking forward to being part of that ride. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're looking, I tell you, as an, as an analyst, I'm looking forward to writing about it. I've got a feeling of, and by the way, not everybody watches Game of Thrones. No. In fact, I haven't either, but yeah, lots of people have. Paul. Hi. Uh, my name's Paul Gubbins. I am the VP of CTV Strategy for a global CTV ad server called Publica. I know it's lots of words, but... Um, Effectively, what we do is help streaming publishers and smart TV manufacturers create linear-like TV ad breaks so they can attract more advertiser demand, but more importantly, um, ensure that those ad breaks aren't showing the same ads back to back. I think we've discussed this already today, how some yeah. ad pods are quite clunky in the evolving CTV ecosystem, and that's what we look to try and help those streaming publishers 
resolve. Um, to answer your question around measurement, it's a difficult um, subject to address. Isn't it, Jeff? Um, I think I heard somebody else mention this point on another panel, but I think the evolution of data and technology in TV advertising has enabled brands to move away from that one to many that traditional linear TV advertising platforms have offered to the buy side to one to few. And I think that's where we are at the moment. It's increasingly difficult for an advertiser to get one overarching holistic view of all of their TV ad buyers. Yes, you can measure within linear and the grown B-Body ecosystem, but we have to be aware there are other environments that exist outside of the broadcaster's ownership in the UK. Um, many of them have attended this event today and yesterday, and by that I mean the growing AVOD and fast apps, and we still can't really measure holistically across everything, and I think that's where we need to get to. Um, but we're not there yet. But there's lots of cool innovation and great development from the likes of SeaFlight that you were just discussing up here yep. previously, and also Project Origin to try and help advertisers figure out incremental reach, um, attribution, and frequency management when they plan and buy in TV environments. Very good. Uh, Chris, last but definitely not least. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Chris Edwards. I'm the commercial lead at Rakuten Advertising, responsible for the media platforms such as Rakuten TV. Um, so to answer the question that hasn't been covered already, um, from a content perspective, I'm going to talk about the consumers. Um, obviously, there's so much choice out there for them to uh, view content, whether it's through traditional linear, whether it's through streaming platforms or free to view ad funded content. And I think with that fragmentation of choice, um, to contribute to total TV uh, is basically following the consumers where they're viewing their content. So whilst many will say that traditional linear is uh, declining because of the variety of choice available out there, we know that the connected TV, uh, VOD or fast channels are certainly contributing to that incremental reach. Now in terms of measurement, um, yes, there's a, a long way to go um, before we have that universal um, approach, but what we can view at the moment is working with several tech partners who can provide that proof of the pudding that incremental reach is available in the streaming spaces with AVOD and FAST. So uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time, but yes, measurement is still uh, some way to go. Well, you've already, all of you have already raised several big issues. Mm -hmm. Why don't we stay, um, I, I think maybe I wanna reach to something you said, Paul, and, and you mentioned about the experience ad duplication, particularly mm -hmm. in ad slots is a great, is a big problem in AVOD. And a boy, I've watched a lot of uh, fast linear <laughs> yep. channels and I can tell you the ad experience often leaves a lot to be desired yep. there. Uh, talk about some of the challenges with that and how on earth mm. we go about solving this, th these issues. I think it's a technology issue in all honesty. Um, lots of either broadcasters, AVOD services, fast services are using tech that hasn't really been built from the ground up around streaming. Without getting too into the, the technical weeds, um, lots of AVOD and fast services are now relying on programmatic technology to help them monetize their ad breaks. However, each of the different SSPs that participate in a programmatic auction for a slot within a publisher's ad break may be responding to that publisher in a slightly different way because there's, there's no unified way yet to really transact CTV. The IAB Tech Lab is doing a great job via the introduction of protocols such as OpenRTB 2.6 to try and streamline that process. But fundamentally, you might have 10 bidders all participating in an auction for a publisher's ad slot, and they all respond to that publisher in a slightly different way. So sometimes the IAB category may not be included. The A domain, i.e. who the advertiser is, may not be included. <coughs> so you've got a publisher that may have done a direct deal via their sales team for an automotive brand, and then via the introduction of programmatic demand, they may have another automotive advertiser or the same automotive advertiser, but because the name of that advertiser isn't passed to the publisher or even the IEB category to say that it's an automotive brand, us as viewers see the same ad back to back in the same ad pods. Um, so to answer your question, it's a technology issue. Yep. Ad servers such as Public, where I work and others, have been built to address this problem. Um, but you're absolutely right. Having a CTV ad break that looks and feels like a linear TV ad break is not only really important for viewers, 
it's really important for advertisers as well because if an advertiser can't manage the basics such as frequency and competitive ad separation like they've been doing for the last 50 years in linear TV, they will spend their money with another streaming surface that can provide structured ad pods. Yeah, yeah. K it, Katie? Well, I, I was just going to say, I think this is what's really interesting around, you know, the way that we've done it on linear for the last how many years is is best practice that is what we should be replicating and 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 that's what we all need to kind of work together to do and it, but also i think what people don't understand is it's really difficult to run a streaming product it's really hard you're trying to integrate lots of different proprietary and third party tech pieces of technology that don't all speak to each other properly and not everyone's thought of every part of the process, especially when you are approaching it from a broadcaster's perspective. So, it, it, you know, we're very much at that stage where we're all sort of learning and developing. And unfortunately, um, some of the viewers aren't therefore yeah. receiving the best service, but people are trying. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm even finding situations where the ads don't come at what I would consider to be a convenient yes. time. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm being kind there. Uh, what's going on there? Why, why is that happening? That's because the marker, the, 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 when, some, when, when whoever it is has got that, that sort of content ingested, the marker that tells you where the natural ad break is just isn't in that piece of content. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that doesn't help. So I think, I, 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 I actually think that the experience problems that we're seeing is, is actually pretty closely related to the measurement problems as well, right? These disconnected systems. Um, are, we, are we just really getting used to the fact that there's not going to be a single voice of truth anymore? Is that, mm. there's just not going to be a barb that says, this is what it is, you know, this is, this is how you did. Is that what we're getting used to, Chris? No, I think, I think there will be a point where there'll be a independent universal measurement tool. I mean, it's, it's going to be championed by someone. I think it will happen. So when you say what we're going to be talking about uh, 12 months time, uh, I, I think we'll be very ten, much on track. Ten, ten? ten okay, months. ten months time. <laughs> uh, we'll be very much on track to having that universal measurement because um, look, everyone wants it. Uh, no one's shirking away from it. Um, it's just getting all the parties mm. uh, to agree on, on on the I guess the model that's going to be measured on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the audience. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think with you know some of the linear uh, players who have been talking today. Um, with the direction they're taking their um, uh, platforms, then it's certainly going in the right direction with, you know, with ITVX, for example. So I think, yeah, it's all going in the right direction. You do? You're, so you're Chris, Chris is the optimist. Jay Dev, are you just as optimistic? Um, yeah, yeah, I am actually. I think uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Can't you tell? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, what am I doing here? <laughs> um, no, I think... The, the beauty about technology is there's not really much that can't be solved for it. There's always a solution. It's just, it's more people problems. It's just, can we bind people together and get them working together? Kind of align all the ships. And if we can do that as an industry, we can solve this because technically it's not a lot. I mean, we're sending people to Mars right now, right? Te we can put an ad in a yeah. spot, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Well, we're trying to anyway. Don't we have to go to the moon first? <laughs> yeah. and then we'll but well, I mean, I, we're flying rockets back down and we're reusing them. <laughs> I, I think, no, Colin, to answer your question as well, right, traditionally TV has been um, panel-based measurement. With the evolution of addressable TV and connected televisions that are plugged into the internet, it's now more about impression level measurement. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen um, Hayley from NBCU that was talking very articulately about their RFP for new types of measurement providers. And I think, yes, we'll absolutely be able to measure, but the way we've historically done it in traditional TV may not be the way that we do it moving forward. Um, yeah. Because fundamentally, yes, it's still a big screen TV in people's living rooms, but the delivery mechanism is very different from what it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, okay, so aside from making measurements a little bit more transparent, how can we make it easy for media buyers to engage their audiences um, in premium, premium streaming to CTV? Jay, Jay Dev, why don't you take a shot at this one first? Um, well, I mean, there's a few ways, right? Uh, I mean, you can just see, there's loads of creative ways you can do it. Uh, the best example is probably the NFL and QR code flashing around your screen, although may not necessarily, you can probably do that in linear terms as well. I think it's probably better to focus more on the advertisers and how they engage. And it's more about 
not so much the new entrants, but those kind of DTC and local brands that are coming in play now, like they kind of were introduced by Sky Ad Smart and they kind of brought them on and gave them access to this big screen, but programmatics definitely enabled them further because there's almost no minimum spend for them to be on a big screen TV now. And I'm seeing studies where it's probably because of the type of content or the audience or they have more local reach, whereas when you buy with a broadcast, it's more mass. Uh, but the ROI seems to be six times more through programmatic than it is on linear. Now, that's still to go more, and they, they've got to do more A-B tests and figure it out. But the signs are definitely positive, and I feel like they are kind of like the key advertisers that CTV has enabled further, and they've grown them out. And they're probably the ones that are going to be able to engage more audiences going forward, just because they're kind of innately positioned where they can almost press a button here and instantly see the return in, of investment and see if their products have sold. Whereas for larger brands, it's a bit more difficult and they've got to do more econometric modeling and they've always got other ads and so it's kind of like which one actually bought in performance for them. Whereas the other guys, the, the DTC brands, they're a bit more aligned and they can see almost instantly. Yeah, Chris? Um, I mean, to reiterate uh, Jada's point, um, I think with engagement, I mean, Rakuten operates in both the performance pool and the branding pool. And we've always tried to sort of connect the dots um, and, and that engagement in content, whether it's through the QR coding and shoppable ads, is certainly something we've, we've developed. Uh, and I think that is the, the first step into, you know, what the programmatic world can deliver. And you know, linear, not necessarily following suit because they do have those solutions, but it's, it's been able to provide that proof to the brands uh, and their advertisers, sorry, the agencies and their advertisers, sorry, um, um, that um, there is an ROI at the end of the, yeah. end of the funnel. Yeah. That makes me, you know, one of the things that I'm, um, I am fearful about with Amazon is they can nail that, right? like mm -hmm. nobody else does. I mean, that gives them a huge advantage. Massive, right? massive advantage, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think it's something that we should all, um, all, all pay attention to. I, I got a question, quick question for the audience. Raise your hand. Have you ever uh, grabbed a QR code from your TV screen? Raise your hand if you've done that. So I see that's, that's about 25%, would you say? Yeah, Something like that, maybe. Yeah, I'd say that was optimistic. Was that being generous? <laughs> <laughs> For the people that are watching this at home. I mean, I'm not sure that I've seen it that massively on TV yet. I think yeah, it will early. come. Yeah, it will come a bit more. Occasionally, so yeah. I, I see and, it occasionally. And we were saying, you know, on, on a format more like a like a pause ad, you can see it working. We we use it a lot in the US in that sense. Mm. So that's when someone yeah. obviously pauses something they're watching and they go away. You know, having a static QR code is easier to catch, right, than someone having to then rewind it, pause it themselves, mess around with it. So probably it works better in some formats than others. Yeah, I, I find it, I still find it very clumsy to, you know, if I get my phone up and mm. no. I have to get out my seat. I hate yeah. that. <laughs> you can't zoom in, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can. The camera can zoom. Oh, but then maybe if I had a decent phone, <laughs> yeah. I could do that. Uh, I'm still using a Pixel 3. Um, Katie, let's stay with you. Um, how, how, we build, how do we build scale for connected TV audiences? You're right at the sort of form up f forefront of that, combining audiences now. <coughs> how do we build stale, scale? I mean, the reality is when it comes to proper targeting, the only people have, who have scale are people like Google and Facebook. And that's why we need to get to a more unified way of allowing advertisers to buy all CTV inventory because genuinely unless you are a very specific advertiser the way that the way that you would access the different pools of connected tv inventory at the moment you can't build scale you know so um it, it, you know we have got to collaborate more and and I, you know, and let, as I say, if you're if you are a big brand advertiser, you you will be using this as a as a reach extension, not not to not that sort of high targeting. It's all about, and that again comes back to that centralised measurement and um, buy being able to buy from one point or in the same way across all these different sources. It seems to me that this is like one of the most important topics that we can talk about yeah. because when I look at that, when I look at the numbers, it is horrifying how big. Google, YouTube, and um, uh, Amazon share of the advertising pie is today. I mean, you saw the growth that I showed in, in, in the graphs at the beginning, 
we're seeing huge growth. But if it's all gobbled up by Amazon and, and, and mm. Google YouTube, that's not going to do anybody in this room any good, is it? No. So this seems like a really def defining issue. Any, anybody else want to um, weigh in on how we build this scale? Well, I mean, yeah, like Kate said, I think the uh, collaboration is key, but also bringing together content that can't be accessed mm. elsewhere. You know, I mean, you know, Kate has got a great stack of you know, original content, um, exclusive content, you know, as has uh, Rakuten. So I think with consumers looking for content they can't access elsewhere, uh, we'll always have that uh, demand. We'll yeah. always have that, um, you know, that popularity to be able to find something that they can't reach elsewhere. Yeah. I, I think it also comes down to discoverability. Smart TV manufacturers are increasingly becoming advertising businesses themselves. So it's in their vested interest to put those free AVOD or low cost or fast services front and center when, when their viewers turn on those devices. Um, so I liken the CTV stream and app space to probably where the mobile app space was 12 years ago. The app stores hadn't been fully productized. They weren't very intuitive. And you know many people still struggle to navigate the menus on their connected TVs to go and find the AVOD apps. But again, as those AVOD apps become front and center on the televisions, the search and discoverability functions become much better. Increasing amounts of time will be spent within them, and that's when we get inventory liquidity, and that's when we start to get to a particular point around scale when it becomes really, really attractive for those big linear-like advertisers to transition from maybe traditional environments into the addressable environments that we're seeing launch increasingly in Europe from the US. Yeah, uh, funnily enough, though, when I check the platforms, when I do searches, the virtual linears, the, the f fast mm. linears, are not showing up in those yeah. searches yet. Um, where they are showing up, and unfortunately they tend to be promoting their own services, is in those recommend, you know, the, the, the hero bar at the top, yeah. which are basically advertising. Yeah. Um, and, and they're pushing their own services. So I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about that. Uh, so mm. on that point, if I. I'm not here representing Samsung, but they do make pretty decent TVs. Um, but on my Samsung TV the other night, I was just browsing and I, I didn't know what to watch. And I kind of have two options. I can pull up the TV guide, which will have all the um, linear TV channels and the Freeview channels, and it's quite text heavy, uh, or the Samsung's guide. And they basically had these nice pictures of Peaky Blinders and Lincoln Lawyer, and then Pulp Fiction Movie was up there. And I just clicked on the Pulp Fiction movie because I hadn't seen it for a while. And I was directed into the UK TV player app, watched two ads, and then watched the movie. I had no idea I had the UK TV player app on my TV. <laughs> Zero idea. Uh, I didn't even know that it existed, and it showed that movie. Uh, no. So the mm. discoverability there that I found was genuinely a good experience. And it was almost YouTube-esque, whereas I think the more I use it, the more it'll figure out what content, and it will bring it in from everywhere. It will bring it in from Netflix and Disney and Rakuten and like, I mean, Rakuten have got, you can slip me a tenner later, but like, <laughs> so it's got like kind of Netflix-esque documentaries, especially when it comes to like, you know, the Barcelona documentaries, and then you can probably get some discovery stuff in there coming through. So I think the TVs are definitely working their way, and then it will just be down to the audience. It's what content does that individual like, mm. as opposed to which way they tend to go and which way the algorithms on the TV fit. So it'd probably be a more democratized mm. landscape. At least for now, it sounds, I mean, I agree with you. You gave a great example there of how easy the entry can be made by the platform if it advertises your content. And that's the big if, right? If it's your content and your service that they happen to be promoting. Um, yeah, that's a really important point. I, actually, we, we mentioned originals, and I wanted to talk about the importance of originals in um, Avod and Fast, Fast Linear. Um, we're just now beginning to see uh, real free uh, online TV providers making commitments, solid commitments to making originals. Um, very much. Uh, targeted and limited approaches. It's not the scattershot approach that we're seeing from the folks like Disney and, and Netflix, etc. cetera. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what you think the impact of those, those originals will have on the growth of our business. And if it's, if it's one of these uh, virtuous cycles where it will you know, cause more money to flow in and we'll see better quality and if, that, if we're gonna see that, 
Um, who'd, like to, who'd like to kick off with that the impact of originals, Chris? Well, I mean, I'll certainly start because we have, uh, Rakuten TV has a, a roster of original content. Uh, Rakuten is uh, firmly footed in the world of sport. So we've previously sponsored the likes of Barcelona FC, uh, the NBA team, Golden State Warriors. So we have a firm heritage in sport. And so that leads our uh, a sort of legacy production of, um, of original content around the world of sport, factual sport documentaries. Um, and that's certainly been in demand. And I think, you know, what I alluded to earlier was that type of content, which, you know, isn't duplicated elsewhere. Um, so it's, it's original, it's unique, um, and it's a source of entertainment. So that's one area of originals that we've certainly um, invested in heavily, and that will continue. Um, but then on the back of that, there's also curated factual content um, that we work with our publisher partners um, to live within that same ecosystem. Because whilst you can come on to Rakuten to watch uh, any Hollywood movie, but then you can also stream and, and access whether on, on demand or in a fast version, anything from The Guardian through to the original sport documentaries. Very good. Then Discovery's made a big uh, commitment to originals for the streaming platforms. I don't think you've made any outside of, outside of the paywall though, right? No, we do. We've got six free-to-air channels in the UK actually, and we have about, I think, you know, it's not huge, but we have a, a decent local commissioning budget for those free-to-airs. But it's interesting, isn't it? It's all about serving, trying to serve as many parts of the ecosystem as you possibly can and moving people in and out of a paid for and free environment at, at the right time because especially at the moment people's you know budgets are slightly more challenged and and so it's unlikely that you'll probably keep someone in a paid for environment 12 months of the year right they they, they probably some of them are going to churn in and out depending on what you've got you know and that's part of the reason for the strategy that we've taken of you know trying to pull together more and more premium content is to keep people on the service as much as possible. And you, you need to be relevant to as many people in the household as possible if you want to be one of those big global streaming giants, right? You, you want there to be literally no day of the week when someone in the family isn't going, oh yeah, but, but the latest Champions League game is on, or the next episode of 90 Day Fiance is about to come out, or there's a new, you know, um, Hanna-Barbera, uh, you know, kids show on. And that, that's where the, the big players are trying to get to how that works out i mean how that works out for everyone else is is what's going to be it's going to be interesting isn't it the role for local players and um and also the free and fast where it's you know you you kind of yeah there's more ability to mix existing content and how you create it is probably going to be more important yeah yeah um so we are not going to stand on ceremony in in this particular panel as it's the last panel so if you have a question stick your hand up if i see it i'll i'll, I'll plug you into the discussion as we go along we're we've got a few minutes left um, i'm going to throw in a quick quick fire question actually it's a two-part we'll do a little bit longer on the second part the first part quick fire in 20 seconds or less um, if you could fix just one thing in ctv what would it be uh, and I think we'll start with, well, Katie's looking at me. I think she's got That's something. That's only because I was thinking. <laughs> that was a, I was concentrating. So I, I tell you, how about you start, JDev? If you could fix one thing, what would it be? Oh, it's got to be the uh, consumer experience, right? In order to get the scale, you need the consumers. And so the ads need to just leave it to uh, gubbins over here to sort that out. Thank you. Chris, what would you do? Um, I just want to call it TV. You know, as soon as we can move oh, yeah. away from connected TV and just call it TV, you know, just like the smartphone is no longer called the smartphone, it's a phone, um, that'll be, I'll be the happy place then. But that's half of the things that we discuss, the difference. <laughs> I know, what will we talk no, about it. then? <laughs> <laughs> Paul? Uh, measurement. If we resolve measurement, the advertising budgets will, will start to really transition from linear into addressable environments. Katie? I think it is the tech, isn't it? It's getting all the tech to work. You know, I'm supposed to be a head of ad sales and yet I spend the vast majority <laughs> of my time talking to tech vendors about why we can't get this to do that when it should be doing also that and plugging that bit in. And I'd quite like to get out and talk to clients and agencies again. Mm. <laughs> Very good. Um, so the second part of this, I'm gonna pull this right out of the guidance on this, um, on this panel, which I really love this question. I think John, it was you that came up with this. It's a really great question. Um, if broadcast signals were switched off in 2025, what would be the priority steps to ensure CTV was an adequate broadcast replacement? Here's a big question for you. 
So I think, Katie, you've got a really, another broad smile on your face. <laughs> I think you have some ideas for us. What do you think? Well, I mean, we need better, better internet, right? Mm. I mean, fundamentally, at the moment, I mean, they're, you know, they're a very, very valuable partner of ours and, and the amount of um, development that Sky are doing is impressive and we're fully you know, on board with that. And Glass is fantastic as an experience, as a consumer, but it is like the delay for when you might see a live goal versus your next door neighbor is at the moment too significant. You know, it, we need, that all needs, the infrastructure needs sorting out first. Yeah. Yeah, I spend a lot of time explaining glass to American audiences. That they, it's a completely foreign concept, a very visionary concept. Yeah. Um, Paul, what do you think? Um, I think we'd have to deploy a concept called server-side ad insertion. It exists today. It's the piece of tech that fundamentally enables a streaming broadcaster to deliver content in a seamless way with ads. It's not really adopted at scale yet, but if we were to switch off the linear feed and advertisers were forced into addressable TV environments without the scaled adoption of server-side ad insertion, the ad breaks would still be really, really clunky. So I think, again, we need to fix the tech infrastructure to create linear-like TV ad breaks. You know, it's funny you should mention that. I was having um, a beer with a friend of mine a couple of days ago, and he told me about his experience using an older Roku. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't name the service, but he was watching a very popular show on this service with ads. And he talked about horrific delays, you know, yeah. spinning wheels yeah. for the... Right. I was absolutely stunned that this particular provider, a major provider, wasn't using server-side mm. ad insertion, it was using client-side. Yeah. But at the moment, it brings its own challenges, right? Because sure. when you're trying to do proper, like, programmatic, mm -hmm. you know, it, it does have its own challenges. Yeah. Chris, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I think most of it's been said, but I, I would say internet speed is, uh, is crucial. I mean, I... I live outside of London and uh, I experience the spinning wheels even <laughs> on my own TV. So, uh, yeah, that, I think that's, that's imperative. Yeah. And Jay, do you have anything to, anything to toss Gosh, into the like equation? I've taken all of them, haven't I? Um, I think that the sort of the running theme here just seems to be the consumer experience right now. So it's the internet's got to be faster and the ad insertion's got to be better. So to add to that, because we are talking about ads here, it's probably to make it more addressable somehow and make the quality of ads that they see. Um, you know, so you've got to think of GDPR compliancy and you've also got to think of the signals that we get and the data that we collect to make those ads relevant to that user. That just, it makes it a better experience um, if you have an ad that's relevant to you. Um, so figuring out how we can take those data signals somehow across everyone, not just one or two fast channels and feed that in uh, where everyone's kind of following the same rules and playing by the same book, that will just make the experience much better. So um, one of the things that we talked about, um, there was a brilliant presentation this morning which really emphasised how many uh, CTV platforms there are out there. I can tell you that it's having a huge impact, um, Katie knows this because she's in the business of producing apps, it's having a huge impact on service providers because you have to maintain so many apps. What sort of impact is that having on the advertising economy? Is it, is it causing lots of problems too? No? Well, yeah, because it means, you know, each time you're, you're building an app, which is slightly different, so your tech doesn't always work the same way as it does on every other. So that's the issue, yeah. 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 What about um, licensing content to different platforms? So you know, um, they all want their different, they all want cuts of your ads, they all want some of your content in their ad supported services. Um, that must complicate the issue as well, right? Or not? I mean, as a, you know, we're, we, are, we, were, we are fundamentally all come from, our, in our DNA is that we're a pay TV company, which means we are used to working with lots of different distributors in lots of different ways. This is just kind of the new world version of that. But yeah, it does, it does make life more interesting and you do have to kind of really think through what you're doing with all of those different people to make sure that you're delivering the best thing for your for your brands because actually fundamentally you know we have really important brands that we don't want people to forget about they're, they're channel brands and their program brands and you still want people to know that they've come from you so it's working with your partners to make sure that it's, everyone everyone's getting value from that the consumer the platform that you're distributing your content on and then you, the person who's actually paying for that content to be produced. 
I don't know if that answered the question, but... It was, it was good, it was good. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, was about... CTV has been a great opportunity for uh, non-traditional TV providers to step in to the TV space. Is it doing the same for advertisers? Are we seeing a lot of mm -hmm. people who, who previously would never have considered buying CTV, are they buying it now? Well, I mean, I, I can answer that one first. I don't think it's a case of never wanting to buy CTV previously. I think the advantage that CTV has had is, is it's been built on the programmatic uh, uh, landscape. So the access to those digital first brands to get the opportunity to be on the biggest screen in the household mm -hmm. um, is a real attractive pull for them. And so we've seen a number of brands who wouldn't necessarily go down the standard broadcast route because of the minimum spends, the, the, um, the lead times are creative. So, you know, with the, uh, the cost efficiency and the instant turnaround has been a real attractive pull for some of those digital first type brands who are coming into the space. Mm. Yeah. The, the one thing, I, the, the, the warning note I always say about that though, and maybe it's a bit of snobbery, is that we do really need to be mindful of the creative because again, this is about a consumer first experience and, you know, people, were, you know, I was listening to something else earlier, you know, people don't want ads. People don't want shit ads. That's different. They actually quite like good ads. So, you know, I think we just need to be a bit mindful around <coughs> how, and, you know, Sky set up a creative lab when they set up AdSmart to enable, you know, there's ways of doing yeah. it. I'm not suggesting that you have to spend, you know, 10 million quid on a Guinness ad, but you do need to really think about what's going to yeah. work in a, on a big screen environment, in the kind of really hmm. broadcast quality content that you're going to be in, you do need to think about the quality of the ad. So where, where are CTV ads coming from? I, I, I think we've had a lot of discussion about, you know, there's the digital pie and there's the, and there's the TV pie and they're actually being blended a lot now. Um, and so it's actually quite difficult to tell. But, but I've read some reports that have suggested that actually CTV isn't pulling money from television and advertising at all. It's pulling from straight digital advertisers, banner advertisers. It's kind of related to what my question about, um, about non-traditional TV advertisers. Is that happening? Is that a thing? Or, or is it really coming out of TV budgets? I, I would say, um, and Katie probably got better context than I have, but from the conversations I've had with um, friends and agencies, um, at the moment there, is, there are two things that are happening. You've got traditional TV advertisers that are transitioning to addressable environments, but increasingly they're testing broadcaster BVOD services because they can still, again, measure and apply all of their legacy measurement protocols to BVOD inventory. Um, but the growing opportunity on the buyer side is to transition digital first social advertisers, direct consumer advertisers into AVOD and fast um, inventory because they haven't got the same legacy requirements around measurement. They're used to planning and buying around data and they've, they've also got 10 years of programmatic experience under their belts already. So they're moving a lot quicker into addressable TV than say some of the the bigger and more legacy type linear advertisers that may now just be starting to test BVOD because they can still apply their traditional TV measurement practices in those environments. Um, so it's all types of advertisers, but those that are used to applying technology, data and programmatic are moving much quicker into CTV, from my experience. I, I wonder if the opening up of SVOD services to advertising now uh, the quite broad opening up. I wonder if that's going to attract... Well, many of them are going to bring traditional advertisers, TV advertisers with them, right? Yeah. It, again, it's this piece about extending reach, isn't it? You know, if, you are, if you're a mass market brand, you, don't, you do want to reach 90% of the population within four weeks of your ad being launched, right? That just is how you build brands. And so those black holes that we've got at the moment in reaching some of those 90% of certain audiences because, you know, up markets, youngs aren't on the linear channels as much anymore. That's why, how those um, advertisers will use those platforms. I think the, the big barrier for some of those mass market brands, which is probably why they haven't been leaping on the CTV bandwagon, is about CPMs, right? And CPT. So on TV, historically, they've been paying quite reasonable CPTs and quality CTV advertising inventory is much higher priced. You know, BVOD is much higher priced than, than um, you know, than you can buy an adult on TV. So it, it's, a, it's a blending of efficiency and effectiveness and testing different messaging and, 
And also for the big national broadcasters, it, it will be about targeting, but targeting of creative and the specific messaging. So, which is why, you know, AdSmart, for example, most of the money into AdSmart is the big national broadcasters. It's not your local um, car dealership. And that's because they can be specific as Asda about this is the product I'm going to promote in this area versus the product I'm going to promote in this area. So it, it, people are using it for lots of different reasons, but yeah. Very good. So we are just about out of time. I didn't see any hands, so I'm going to go to my last question. This is the last question of the conference. Remember, what will we be talking about at CTV 2023, just 10 months away in March 2023? And I think we will start with Chris. Okay, um, without mentioning the, the big Netflix elephant in the room, <laughs> I think the topic will be <laughs> hybrid streaming. Um, so a combination of your pay-per-view, your ad lights, and your free to view combined. I mean, Rakuten's been operating in the hybrid service uh, for the past two years, but I think, you know, with, with what's happening uh, on the horizon with the, uh, the big SVOD services, I think hybrid streaming is going to be. I think, I think the time is ripe for combination monetization models. Absolutely. <laughs> Paul? Uh, for me, I think we'll be discussing attribution. So if uh, an ad is displayed on a streaming service, is there the opportunity for the viewer to convert within that service's walled garden? Or does the viewer take out their phone and convert via the phone? If they convert via the phone, who owns that attribution component? So what does the purchase funnel look like for CTV advertising, basically? Very good. Katie? I mean, I would say it's definitely about hybrid because we are the first global SVOD to launch uh, ad-supported uh, tier in this market. But... Um, I, I mean, I think it will just be about more and more proliferation, actually, of opportunity and whether we've got any closer to being able to pull that together from a measurement. Because there, there are so many more project, uh, products launching. There's, there's so many more to come. It's okay. going to go like that before it comes like that, I think. <laughs> yeah. I know what I'm going to be talking about. I, we'll get to you just a second, J. Dev. I'm going to be talking about HBO Max and Discovery. <laughs> That's, <coming> <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. J. Dev, last word. Gosh, uh, I feel like dropping some uh, lyrics or something for, uh, from Wiley and Dean. I did say no article. repeats. You can't get off the stage. <laughs> no repeats. It's a CTV conference. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, yeah, I agree with uh, these guys, what they said. Maybe we've got a new acronym that we're talking about. Yeah. Come up with Industry something. loves an acronym. Maybe we should come up with one now. Any suggestions? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> I don't know. There's something that's <laughs> homework. Maybe we'll come up with it by 2020. Yeah, yeah. In 10 months' time, we'll have a new acronym. <laughs> All right. That is it, folks. Well done. You've survived the, uh, the CTV Summit of 2022. Thank you all for your kind attention. And we'll see you again next year. <laughs>